Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. The fragile 1952 tranquility of a young boy's world explodes one summer day when a leopard escapes from the Oklahoma City Zoo, throwing all the local residents into dangerous excitement in Stephen Harrigan's story of a child's confrontation with his deepest fears. The novel The Leopard is Loose is a encapsulation of America in the 1950s and a portrait of a boy's struggle to find his place in the world. For Grady McClarty, when news breaks that a leopard has escaped from the zoo, the playthings and imagined fears of his childhood begin to give way to real-world terrors, most imminently the dangerous jungle cat itself. Stephen Harrigan's previous novels include New York Times bestselling The Gates of the Alamo, Remember Ben Clayton, and a friend of Mr. Lincoln. He is a writer at large for Texas Monthly as well as a screenwriter, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Stephen Harrigan to this week's book show. How are you? I am good. Thank you, Joe. I'm delighted to to be talking to you today. It's a lovely, lovely novel that you have written. I I note that your last book was very long. This book, by (laughs) comparison, is much shorter. How long has this story been in you? I guess since I was about four or five years old, there was a real event. I, I lived in Oklahoma City uh, when I was very young, and there was a real event that took place in 1950 when a leopard escaped from the zoo, and the whole city went insane. Everybody was out trying to hunt the leopard with their guns and their hunting dogs, and I, I heard about that. You know, there was a big story in Life magazine. It was kind of national news. And I'd heard my family talking about it. I was only two at the time. For some reason, it lodged in my mind and made a big impact on me. And, uh, you know, recently during the pandemic, I started to think about, you know, what life would have been like for a five year old child in that time, in that place, and under those circumstances. So I just kind of concocted a novel about it. When you say concocted a novel, so there are strains of what you saw and what you did and what your recollections are, but Mm -hmm. you also move the timeline around to facilitate the fictional tale you wanted to tell. Right. I moved the the event up about uh, two years so that in my real life, I was uh, five years old in 1952, which is about the age I wanted this character, this little boy, to be. It's a novel that takes place very, very close to home in, in my memory. I, I, I set the novel, actually, in the, in the house I lived in when I was that age. The people in the novel had the same phone number we had when I was that <laughs> age. It was a very interesting experiment to me. I'd never written anything autobiographical. But it was fascinating to kind of, uh, you know, probe my own memories, uh, you know, relive some of the uh, just some of the tone and texture of of the Oklahoma City in the early 1950s and sort of filter them through, uh, you know, the consciousness of who I am now. Were the family dynamics similar or the same? The character's father has died in the war. Uh, His mother is living with her mom and dad. And you and your brother are there with also two uncles, uh, your the the mother's brothers. Yeah, that's all based on 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 my reality at that time. My my father had been a a fighter pilot in World War II and a test pilot afterwards, and was was killed in a plane crash before I was born. My mother moved home to Oklahoma City to live in a you know in a house with with my grandparents and and her siblings. So. The basic, you know, layout of of the house and the the family arrangements are pretty pretty taken from real life. I have changed quite a bit uh, this, in terms of some of the characters, particularly the two uncles, who are much more troubled than uh, the, the four actual uncles who lived uh, with us in that kind of family compound in Oklahoma City. By doing that, by kind of creating a a springboard, like a real springboard for the story, I was able to use some of my own memories. And they're very scant at that age when you're five years old, but they're vivid. That gave me a door to kind of examine the consciousness of a five-year-old boy uh, at that time and place and, and, and you know, in, in a situation in which the adults around him were behaving strangely, or at least as they're portrayed in the novel. So at the beginning of the book, 
Grady McLarty is writing to the Oklahoma Historical Society, is 70 years old, and basically is answering a query from them to tell them what he remembers of the leopard escape. Exactly, and that's kind of the uh, strategy for the way I was able to tell this story. It, it, it's basically a first-person story of an older man looking back on his younger self, knowing as he tells the story the things he didn't know when he was five years old. It's kind of an examination of childhood, of course, but also of, of memory and nostalgia and, uh, and all the fears and, and uh, you know, terrors that a five-year-old mind can conjure up. He says this might turn out to be a lengthy document. Your request had the effect of knocking the lid off of a big box of memories and reminding me that despite or because of a lifetime in the car business, I've always imagined a parallel existence for myself as a writer. So you are the writer. Did it knock the lid off the box of memories for you? It, it did, yes. Once I started thinking about the the idea of telling a story set in in a place where I lived at a, at a time where I was, you know, kind of emerging, my consciousness was starting to emerge and my memories were starting to emerge. It was uh, exhilarating to write this story. Uh, I would go back to Oklahoma City from time to time. I live in Austin, Texas, which is, you know, about 400 miles away. And I would go back to Oklahoma City and kind of revisit the haunts of my childhood and sort of take in the uh, just the memories that kind of they didn't come flooding in, but they were securely lodged. I mean, I, I uh, the houses, the, the the places I write about, the restaurants, the movie theaters, those were all vivid to me in my memory. And of course, I augmented uh, all that with research and reading and stuff like that. So, at the heart of this, of course, is the leopard is loose. Give us a, a sense of of what you remember of that and ultimately what happened in Oklahoma City that, that really caused such a ruckus at the time. Well, what I remember of it, of the actual event, is, is, is nothing. <laughs> but I do remember we good, went to the zoo all the time in Oklahoma City. And I do remember, for some reason, I have a vivid memory of standing in front of uh, – of this stuffed leopard at the zoo. And I didn't know why among all these uh, live animals, there was a, uh, an unmoving animal and it kind of had an effect on me in a really strange way. And this was the leopard who escaped. And, and I, I think it's not too much of a spoiler to say that it did not end well for the leopard. Right. But uh, what was interesting to me about it, I think what, what made the book work in my imagination for me was the idea of, of a little boy experiencing a lot of frightening destabilization around him. Not just the escaped leopard, but the opportunity it gave for uh, people to, uh, for older people, for adults to kind of uh, reemerge from a post-war uh, sense of false confidence, maybe. You have all these veterans who had uh, who had, you know, their rifles from, from the war. You had all these people who were kind of used to action and used to doing things, who were kind of caught in that undertow of, of, of post-war life where they hadn't quite found their place yet or didn't know where they belonged. And that's how I imagined uh, these two uncles who are at the heart of the story. These are people who who have been seen you know, intense combat in World War II, are having a tough time finding their place in the post-war world. And here's suddenly an opportunity to put all those skills, those, those, those action skills and hunting skills in, into play in a way that, that frightens the boy, but gives them a sense of, of, of purpose, I think. Stephen Harrigan is the author of the new novel, The Leopard is Loose. The book is published by Knopf. It is interesting to me in, in writing about those two characters of the uncles who, as you say, have gone through so much during the war. It's several times in the novel, they're hoping that that gives them something in the sense of, can I get down this road that is closed? I served here. This is what I did. And realizing that it doesn't. 
that weird feeling that they have, which is I fought for my country and I can't go down the road that I want to do. And I was good enough to fight for this country and to go into battle. And yet I can't help take down a leopard that is scaring the city. You're referring to a scene in which they're trying to, to go down a road where the National Guard is keeping them right. out. And and one of the one of the uncles, Frank, is so incensed because of everything he's experienced in the war. And you have this, you know, little pimply faced uh you know, private telling him he's not he's right. not allowed in, in this area. And I think that, you know, these uncles are they're just at large in a way. They're 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 at sea, really, uh, both in their professional life and their personal life. They haven't yet found the zone where they belong, and and it's true of a lot of the characters in this book too. You know, the boys, the little boy's mother, has been just as my mother was, has been shattered by this, uh, you know, this tragedy where her her husband was was suddenly killed, and she's trying to make a new life for these children and starting to have a new relationship with another man, which causes uh, Grady, the little boy, to to kind of scratch his head and wonder what's going to come of that. So everyone is kind of, I I think the the leopard escaping from the zoo is is kind of the, uh, is the opening wedge in a lot of, 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 of destabilizing behavior among all these adults. And meanwhile, Grady's grandfather sort of sits and and is a car dealer and is looking at all of this and trying to figure everything out and to do us what's best for the family, doesn't quite know what to make of his sons, is worried about his grandchildren, and doesn't necessarily think that the, his two kids should be out trying to find a leopard with all the other people who are out there trying to find a leopard. Yeah, I mean, he does not approve of this activity. And, uh, you know, he himself was sidelined during World War I because he got the flu during the pandemic. So his sons have been through something he can't comprehend. To some degree, he can be sympathetic to it, but he doesn't really understand what they've experienced during the war. Uh, so he is trying to kind of triangulate you know, these relationships and, and to keep everybody safe and happy. And it's a difficult time to do that, for sure. In real life, the leopard's name was Luther, leapt out of a an 18-foot deep pit from the zoo, was 175 pounds, and as we said, just, just put the, the city into ultimate fear uh, and anxiety over what was going to happen. I don't know if that would happen today, right? I mean, I, I don't think we, we have the tracking and so forth, but, but to, to think of an animal that is loose, it's, it's interesting of how it takes over a city. It's kind of interesting because it's happened fairly recently. There was a tiger loose in, in Houston, I think, last year. And you read accounts of, uh, of, of leopards in India and places like that that escape every now and then. So it's not all that unusual, but I think we're so saturated with news today, you know, with 24-hour news, that, that an event like that would be mentioned a couple times on, 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 you know, during a news cycle and then been forgotten about. Here it was uh, just intensely uh, observed and, and felt by everyone. And, uh, you know, you, there are all these photos that you can find in, online mm. of, you know, kids uh, being, you know, not allowed to go outside, and uh, there were there were T-shirts made of, of leopard hunting T-shirts, and it was only it only lasted like three days, but it was really intense. There was even a singing group that sprang into being called the Leopard Airs that wore leopard leopard skin T-shirts or something or, or, or sports shirts. So it was a, a major major civic event. Partly partly a, an ex, excuse for humor but also an excuse for sort of some dark things to come out. The the leopard became known as Leapy because it leapt out of the out of the pit of course. Um and you mentioned wife 
magazine, but the the that Life magazine article claimed that some three thousand Oklahomans took part in the search. You certainly write about that. There's there's just trucks of people going up and down the streets. Uh, various streets are are closed off. People are trying to. There's a sighting or there's something odd happening. Um, and everybody goes goes nuts for for that, as you say, three day period of time. And I, I would think that would be frightening for a child. Oh yeah, I think so. I, I think uh, you know, I, I there's a scene in the book where the uh, the two children are playing in a sandbox in this park. Yeah. The, the Grady and his older brother. And, you know, as I imagine the scene, they're in the, in the middle of a savanna, basically, you know, a big, huge expanse. And to be to be aware of a of a predator in that kind of situation, particularly for a five year old mind, uh, I think would be really intense. And, of course, Grady has all sorts of, of nightmares and dreams to begin with before this leopard even gets loose. And so, you know, he, he's he is his imagination is just consumed with, with the possibility of this leopard getting him or his brother or his mother. And, uh, you know, he doesn't know enough to, to be able to understand that the chances of that are, are beyond astronomical, but it's, it's a real vivid fear to him and to, to a degree to, to his mother who has, again, his kind of a PS, PTSD, you know, uh, condition from losing her husband in the war and and uh, is very fretful and nervous about what could happen to her children. You write about race in the book. There are a few scenes that talk about the time and also the actions of this family when it comes uh, to those who are African-American in the city. What, what brought you to want to explore those themes? Well, Partly, uh, partly in the time we're living, it felt kind of irresponsible to go back to the 1950s and write about a white family and not take into account the world that they lived in and the privilege they had, you know, un- unacknowledged privilege to them or unwitting privilege, really. But it felt wrong not to include that. And also it was useful just in terms of plot dynamics. There are several points in the book where black and white people interact, often somewhat violently. So it was an opportunity to explore the reality of the world that I'm trying to portray and also to to create scenes that I thought would be interesting and compelling and, and keep the action moving. It's interesting because there are scenes in the book where certain days where African Americans could do certain things and go certain places and they weren't allowed on other days that you write about. That was before my time. I'm 54. But when you think about it, of that being really recent history, and it is, it's it's mind-boggling to read. And and what's interesting is that it's it's mind-boggling for these kids that are sort of watching it, trying to figure it out. Yeah, they don't understand. Uh, there's a scene set at a lunch counter, and this was like four or five years before lunch counters were integrated in Oklahoma City, but there were certain protocols that could be observed, like if you were a, a black person, you could order at the lunch counter, but you couldn't sit there. And, and as any kids do, these, these kids absorb the reality of their world without too much question, but it is sort of churning around in their mind, well, why can this person sit here and that person not? And it's very, you know, I, I didn't experience at first hand some of the things I write about in terms of race in the book, but I, I'm 73 and I vividly remember seeing segregated water fountains and drugstores and places like that. I remember seeing that as a kid and not really understanding what that was about, why why were why were white people and black people had had to drink from separate water fountains? It made it made no sense to me, but I didn't really question it. I, I was just too young, so I just accepted it as part of the world I was living in. When you came to write those scenes, what kind of research do you do for that, and to find out what was happening in Oklahoma City at that time? 
Well, there were there were several memoirs by you know by black activists at that time. There was a there were black newspapers. There were you know there were documentation of this and that in the Oklahoma Historical Society and other places and online. So I just read up on what was ha- what was happening to to the degree I could I could discover it. The book ends with a kind of fight over integrating a uh, an amusement park. And, and that was a, a racial fight uh, in which uh, white people and black people were very much at odds. And that took place in the 1970s. So I kind of took that idea of a, a angry demonstration and, and moved it backward in time to where I could use it as, as a scene in my book. There's something lovely about reading a novel like this where – there's a leopard loose, and okay, that's what ultimately this book is about. The leopard is loose, and the town is dealing with this, and how this family deals with it. And there's, but there's so much more there, and they're all very real things. Uh, they're they're the family dynamics, and there's the the worry and the caring and the love of a family, and that makes it very pleasant and endearing, even though it can be quite bittersweet. Well, th- thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted it. Uh, I, I, this is not an edgy book in the sense that it's, it's uh, <laughs> you know, dark or anything, but it, it does include some uncomfortable truths. And yet I want it to, to be an affectionate look, not a rose-colored glasses look, but a, a look at, at a world that I remember that I felt safe in, that I understood, and that I think has a kind of, I hope, has a sort of universal dimension, because we were all five years old at one point. We were all bewildered at one point, trying to make sense of the world in a way that, in whatever way we could do that. And uh, and there were always outside, for anybody who was five years old, there were always outside concerns and fears, uh, maybe having to do with, with your family, maybe having to do with something was happening in society or the world around you. But I think everyone can relate to this sense of, 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 of a secure world being suddenly at risk and being too young to know what to make of it. There's also the time that you write about, and you touched on this at the beginning of our conversation, but we are we're coming out of World War II and we're we're just getting into Korea, right in the in the novel mm-hmm. and figuring out where America is right now, figuring out right. the this time that we now have such nostalgia for of the early nineteen fifties. It was tense at times. It was a very complicated time. And I think it was you know, in some ways it's it's interesting because one of my daughters read this book recently and she has two young children, five and three. And she felt like she really related to it because of the pandemic and because of the sort of amorphous fear that that all young parents have been going through the last two years about their children and whether they were safe. And there was this, you know, metaphorical leopard on the loose the last two years with this pandemic that is a, a background menace even though in the 1950s were a far different time than what we're living through now in so many, you know, unfathomable ways, there's still that, I think, uh, there's that connection between the sense of, of being a young mother or being a young child and, uh, and something you don't know about is threatening you. So two random questions. One is at the end of the book, you write in the acknowledgments, Sue Ellen Harrigan, to whom I've been married for 46 years, hasn't read this book yet. We have an agreement that since I crave her approval too much and since the slightest unintended gesture or inflection that could be interpreted as negative would crush me, it's better that she read my books after they're published. As ever, I nervously await her verdict. So her verdict was? She's still reading it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm All right. tiptoeing around the house, and I see her pick up the book. I just go into another room and just try not to make eye contact. <laughs> uh, I I really resonated with that. I, I thought, yeah, that's sort of the relationship I have with my spouse of many decades. <laughs> the the other the other thing too is that um, uh, you mentioned early on that 
your recollection of, of seeing this leopard who is taxidermied in the zoo. You write about it in the book as well, and, and, and I think beautifully because you just described this this animal with a weird peacock in front of it and just sort of looking past it, and it's just very well, odd. But do do we know where the – is the leopard still around? No, and it's a great disappointment to me because apparently it just got lost or thrown out somewhere. There are pictures of it. In fact, pictures of it with with little kids looking at it in the 1950s that reminded me exactly of who I was. But somewhere along the way in some some renovation of the Oklahoma City Zoo or one of the buildings, somebody tossed it, apparently. Which is is pretty ignominious for a leopard. Well, and pretty odd given the, even now, I mean, people still, I mean, you're writing about it. Other people have written, I mean, it's a, it was a big event in the city's history. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it, it, it deserved to be preserved and maybe somebody took it home and put it in their living room, but I don't think it exists anymore. When you finish something like this and um, assuming you get praise eventually from your wife, what will be next <laughs> for you? I'm already hard at work on a nonfiction book that's very difficult to explain, but it's also very personal, but it's also kind of tied to historical events. So it's, in some ways, it's a, uh, it's a nonfiction version of this book. In this book, you said it was the first time you'd, you'd written so personally, and, and this coming book will be personal. What do you think is drawing you to sort of examine things that are close to you now? Well, I think it's partly my age. When you get to into your 70s, you, you just naturally look back and try to sort of puzzle out how you got here and what, what, were, the, what were the vectors that led you to who you are. And partly it's just I just finished writing a gigantic history of Texas that was almost like 900 yeah. pages long. And it was nice to kind of step down from that intense research, you know, craftsmanship issues of putting together a book like that to – to try to tell a simple story in which I I already knew everything in a way. I, it was already kind of embedded in, in me, and I just had to kind of bring it out. The name of the new novel is The Leopard is Loose, a novel. It is published by Knopf. Stephen Harrigan, what a great pleasure to speak with you. I thank you so much for speaking to us and for such a beautiful novel. Oh, it was so great to talk to you, Joe, and thanks again for sharing your airtime with me. I really enjoyed it. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org, and you can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program, Book Marcus, for next week. And thanks for listening for The Book Show. I'm Joe Donahue.